Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to church, everyone. Uh, whether you're brand new to our church or have been attending in person, we're glad that you came today. And for those of you that are attending online, well, I have a few announcements, well, quite a few to give to you today. So the first one is some of you have been emailed about sending a short 10 to 15 second video that is going to be put together to send to our missionaries. So if you haven't done that, you can, once you have done that, you can email the church. Uh, the next one is for these guys, our Operation Christmas Child's boxes. Now we have some pre-made at the back, or if you want to put the extra effort and actually put them together yourself, we got both options for your back there, but these, this is a great uh, initiative to bring some joy to a child in another country. Uh, we have a lot of great groups here at a church, but one of the ones um, is the Broken Hearts Care Session. If you missed the first one, there's more than one, so you're in luck. If you want to attend the next sex session, you can find Christina here in the church. Um, Advent season is upon us. There is going to be a community Advent event service, not here, but at St. Paul's Presbyterian Church at 7 p.m. Um, there's going to be scripture, Christmas songs, um, and just gathering of the community to kick off Advent. And the last one is there's on December 14th, there's going to be an event here at the church. Um, again, there's been email sent out to you already about a short survey that's going to help make the game that's going to be prepared even better if games aren't your thing. We are also looking for people to make some food. So there is going to be a sign-out sheet being passed around as I speak here. There is categories on both sides. So if you feel that is your calling to help out with the various needs that we need for this event, uh, you can fill that out. And I just have a, a verse from Psalm 90, verses 1 to 2. It says, Lord, you have been, been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before we, I welcome the worship team on, if you want to just join me in a short prayer. Dear God, thank you for bringing us all here today uh, to the beautiful mountains here in Banff, but there's a place that we can come together and worship together. I want to thank you for the worship band that's going to be coming here and then with being preparing Greg for his sermon. May you speak through him that we can be empowered and to go forth through our day. So, amen. So I will I wor welcome the worship band up. How is everybody today? It's good to have you. Um, let's stand together. We're going to sing a few songs that I hope are familiar to most of you. Um, but if you don't know them, that's okay too. They'll, they'll be a great source of encouragement. So let's, uh, let's sing together. The King above all kings. 
This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be saved. Jesus is sinful, all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations? With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Whoa. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. Why don't you greet someone you haven't seen yet? I stand accused by my regrets And the devil roars his empty threats I will preach the gospel to myself That I am not a man condemned For Jesus Christ is my defense My sin 
sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars. The weight of guilt I bear no more. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Doubt and shame hang over me like the arrows of the enemy. I will run again to Calvary, that rugged hill of hell's deep feet, my fortress and my victory. My sin is nailed to the cross my soul is healed by the scars the weight of guilt i bear no more oh praise the lord oh praise the lord my sin is nailed to the cross my soul is healed by the scars now i'm alive forever It is finished, sin is vanquished, hallelujah, praise the Lord, all the glory, all the honor to my Savior, Christ the Lord. When I stand before the throne at last, His blood will plead my I will worship him with holy hands and raise the song that never ends of Jesus Christ, my righteousness. My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars, the weight of guilt. No more, oh praise the Lord, oh praise the Lord. My sin is nailed to the cross, my soul is healed by the scars. Now I'm alive forevermore, oh praise the Lord, oh praise the Lord, oh praise the Lord. the Lord, O oh my soul, oh, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, worship Your holy name. The sun
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like this. weeks ago we did uh, a new song called The Saving One and so we're going to do it again here to try and keep it fresh in your mind but I can't remember how it goes right now so oh yeah I remember Mercy was revealed, what selfishness and peace, my fate was surely sealed, until he rescued me, his pardon for my sin, his bounty for my need, from slavery and shame, I am in heaven can the glory of the Son. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way, the grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. No fear can hold me down. Nor darkness steal my joy, for blood has been poured out, the enemy destroyed. Death could not hold him down, the cross was not enough to steal away his love for him. In 
heaven can contain the glory of the sun. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way. The grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the And anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved. They will be saved. Anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved. They will be saved. And heaven can't contain. The glory of the sun. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way. The grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. Anyone who calls upon his name. And anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved. They will be saved. Oh, anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved. They will be saved. Amen.
man please have a seat. Thank you, worship team, for that. And uh, the next announcement is for those for Sunday school. There is happening today, so you can go to Sunday school now. And while Greg is preparing for the next part, there is a big event here on Friday, and that was the youth bowling event. There was a lot of hard-fought battles, and there was only one person that came on top, at least in my lane, and that was me. <laughs> so... Until next year, but if you do have a kid in youth, hello, I run the youth program along with another, uh, a bunch of other great leaders, so if you have youth that are in grade 6 to 12, send them to the church here Friday nights from 7 to 12, there is a lot of fun. So, looks like Greg is, is almost ready, ready now, so Greg's going to come up here for the prayer and offering. Did not realize that uh, youth group bowling was so competitive. <laughs> you know, um, if you ever wanted to kind of come help with one of those events, I bet Mark would uh, be happy to have you and uh, give him someone else to compete against. I'm just kidding. But I'm sure he would be happy to have you come. Let's, uh, let's invite the ushers up. We're going to spend a few moments in prayer, and then we'll open scripture together. So let's bow. God, thank you for this morning. What a privilege and an honor it is to be able to come and gather as the body of Christ. Many from this community, many visiting, some just moving here. And it's that great reminder that we are all one body. Regardless of whether we're here, whether we're online, whether we're at home, ill, no matter where we are, we're part of the body of Christ. And so as we seek to accomplish the purposes that you've given us, as we seek to disciple the people uh, in our community, as we seek to reach out to those who don't know you, would you give us a strength? Would we have the courage that we need to step out in faith and to trust you as you lead and as you guide? So God, thank you for this church family. Thank you for all that so faithfully continue to serve in many different ways. Sometimes we see the people up front and, and we can think that that's the only people serving, but the truth of the matter is there's way more behind the scenes than in the front. And so God, we thank you for their dedicated service, for their commitment to this body. We pray for each one as, as they serve that you would strengthen and that you would equip them for the things that you have called them and that they would receive so much joy from serving you and your people. God, we were reminded this morning in our pre-service prayer that there are many of our friends and our families, co-workers that do not know you. And we want to pray for them that they would understand and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would know that there is hope to be found in the name of Jesus. So for those in our lives that we know and that we care for and that we love, we pray for courage to speak truth and in grace and in mercy that they would see and hear who this Jesus is. And we entrust them to you, believing and knowing that you love them far more than we do. That you want to be in relationship with them. What a privilege and what an honor it is that we get to be part of that. To bring the name of Jesus to those who haven't heard. So be with us in that as we share with our friends, our families, our co-workers. Those that we have influence in. God, we pray for our church family. We know there are some still away traveling. Um, we think of Jacqueline and David at the, at the, with their new baby, baby Sharon. We just pray for continued health as they recover and, and learn what it means to be a family of three. We pray for those who are not able to be here in person. We think of Biggie as he's at home today, and we just pray that this would be an encouraging time, that even as he sits and, and watches and and is part of the service from, from just a few blocks down the street, that he would feel as though he's present with us. 
God, for those who are fighting illness or having health struggles, whether that be mental, physical, or emotional, we just pray that whatever the need is in their lives, that you would intervene for them, that you would encourage their hearts, that you would heal their bodies and their minds, that you would restore relationships. God, we thank you that you are involved in all of these areas of our lives. And so we commit this morning to trusting you to see them through. As we give of our tithes and our offerings to you, God, we, we always need that reminder that everything that we have is a gift given by you, not meant only for our use, but that we would steward it well to care for those that you have put in our path. And so, God, would we use what you have given us in a way that brings honor and glory to you. When we see something that we think that we want, would we consider what you have called us to and what you want from us? Would we learn to give to you in a way that is filled with joy and trust, knowing that you will care for us as we continue to care for those that you have entrusted to us? So God, we give to you because you are worthy, and we give to you because we want our church to reach into the Bow Valley, to minister to people who need to hear the gospel, and that we would serve them well. Be with us in these remaining moments as we open scripture. Help us to see it for what it is. These are your words written to us, that we might know your heart that we might see what you have called us to and how, specifically this morning, how you equip us to accomplish those purposes. May we trust you with our lives. Thank you for this morning again. Amen. You can open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, and and here's, I don't know, this is maybe, maybe normal to you, but it always seems to get faster and faster to me, is next week is our last Sunday before Advent. December is just around the corner, and as we kind of go back again to remind ourselves of Jesus' birth and all that God was accomplishing through bringing this, this perfect sacrifice, the substitutionary atonement for us so that we could be forgiven of sin and find hope and peace uh, is truly a remarkable thing, um, but to know that we're already there again is, is hard to believe sometimes. If you're visiting with us, is we've been working through the book of Acts since uh, the last Sunday of December in last year, and we're just kind of plugging our way a little bit at a time. And we've made it all the way to chapter 18, and we're going to finish chapter 18 next week, Lord willing. And that means we're well over 50% anyway, uh, through the book of Acts, and then we'll jump back in in January. But just so you have a little bit of context as to what's been happening in these last chapters, is Paul and and his missionary companions, they're on their second missionary journey, and they've been traveling through various places preaching the name of Jesus. And of course, there's been many that have come to faith in Christ. Churches have been planted in all these little communities as they've gone. God has been faithful, and the missionaries have been faithful to God. But that hasn't come without opposition, and in fact, every single time, uh, they basically get run out of town, whether that be uh, the authority saying, you can't be here anymore, get lost, whether it's a mob that is seeking to actually attack and kill, whether they get imprisoned and then sent off. These things continue to happen over and over, and this morning, we're going to see a break from that, which if you're Paul, you might be thinking, thank you, thank you, Lord, for, for just a little bit of rest. At least, at least rest from this opposition. Not that there isn't opposition, but what happens to him is unique in, in chapter 18. He's going to spend a significant time uh, in the city of Corinth. And of course, we have two letters that are written, uh, First and Second Corinthians, that speak to Paul's time uh, in the city of Corinth. And so I'll reference that just a little bit as we go. But last week, and I think this is really important, especially as we kind of move into into chapter 18, is last week as Paul was preaching in Athens, we talked a lot about contextualization. How do we make the gospel make sense to people who are from a different culture, who speak a different language, who have different understandings, or maybe even a completely different worldview than that of the Bible? And Paul does a great job as he's in Athens looking around and seeing all these idols and finding one that says, to the God of the unknown. And he says... 
What you worship as unknown, I declare to you that, that we know this God, and he is the God of all gods. And he begins to use writings and, and poetic things that have been written in the Athenian uh, city, uh, or with the Athenian people, rather, in the city of Athens, so that the people can understand the gospel in their own way. Uh, he doesn't water it down. He doesn't change it. He doesn't do anything to the gospel other than build a bridge so that people can understand the gospel. And we were reminded of how important that is for us to do in our context. As we have many people from all over the world. Different beliefs, different cultures, different worldviews coming into one tiny, relatively very tiny little part of the world. How are we going to build bridges to them so that we can share with them the good news of Jesus? As Paul moves into Corinth, what we're going to see here. Is Corinth was, was another significant city uh, in, this, in these days, in this first century. But not only was it significant, it was the most diverse city uh, some historians think that, that existed in all of the known world at that time. And part of that was because there were two ports uh, that existed in the city of Corinth, one on the east and one on the west. And so people would come here to do a lot of trading. Um, and as that kind of happened, they would just kind of stay. Just like Banff, right? They come for a month, and we see them for 30 years. <sighs> Maybe that's not always true. But so often, people come, and they get involved, and they fall in love with the town, with the people, and they stay. And, and that's kind of what happened in Corinth, a melting pot of people from all over the world. But one of the challenges with that in that first century was that Corinth was known as, well, it was predominantly known as one thing from a moral standpoint, and that was the greatest city of immorality. In fact, there was a Greek expression that explained just how immoral it was, and it translates in English to this, to live like a Corinthian. That was their way of saying how immoral the city was. It's not exactly a, a pretty picture that's painted. There were people involved in every possible kind of debauchery. And you kind of read some of that in 1 Corinthians when Paul's ministering to the church there. And he's saying, this is what's happening in your city, but you were called out of that. You have been rescued from that to live in such a way that brings honor to Christ. And, and Paul doesn't say, leave your town, leave your city. He says, minister to them, but stand apart from that lifestyle. Be different in the Lord. Paul's going to spend, and we're going to read it here in a moment, Paul spends 18 months in the city of Corinth, which is a significantly longer period of time than he spends anywhere else, at least to this point. And in the midst of that, we're going to see some interesting things. Relatively speaking, uh, Luke doesn't spend a lot of time telling us about the city of Corinth or Paul's ministry there. And so we have to kind of fill in the gaps a little bit with the writings of 1 and 2 Corinthians that Paul talks about his time there. But let's read verses 1 to 17 of this as Paul lands in the city of Corinth. And there's going to be a couple of things that we're going to look at specifically. The first thing that we're going to look at is that God continues to work even when Paul feels that his ministry is futile. Isn't that good news? I think that's great news for us too because how many of you are ministering to a loved one who continues to reject Christ and continues to seek their own way. And you pray for them and you love them and you care for them and, and you try and help them and, and you continually watch them make choices that, that lead away from Christ and sometimes you throw your hands up in the air like Paul's going to do. We're going to read about it. He's going to throw his hands up in the air and be like, I'm done. I have nothing left to offer. Yet God is still working. We're going to see that. The second thing we're going to see as we finish our text is something pretty unique, is that what God says God's going to do, he will do. He is faithful. And we're going to see a very unique story of what happens to Paul, and it happens in real time, where God says, Paul, here's what's going to happen, and he does it. Often we have to wait and be patient. In this text, we're going to see something unique. So let's read together, starting in verse 1 of chapter 18. After this, that's being in Athens, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to them 
And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. Excuse me, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Uh, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Galio, the proconsul of Achaia, sorry, but when Galio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul, brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. Since it's a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galio paid no attention to any of this. That's kind of it. There's not much else written in the book of or in the book of Acts about Paul's time in Corinth. But we know that Paul did much ministry in there. And so we're going to piece together a little bit uh, also from Corinthians. But let's start here at the beginning as Paul meets up with uh, this, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And we don't know a lot about them initially, but what we learn through the rest of the New Testament is that they become significant partners in ministry with Paul over the next few years. We know that they were Jewish people, and we know that they were living in Italy, but Paul tells them, or sorry, but Luke tells us that they had to leave Rome because of Claudius the, Claudius the emperor. Now, I just want to give you just a little bit of context here, but this actually has nothing to do with Corinthians or with this section of Acts. It has everything to do with the book of Romans. But we're just going to take a little detour for a moment. Just so that we can see this. Uh, According to history, somewhere in the late 40s of the first century, Emperor Claudius commanded all Jews had to leave Rome and they were forced to leave. And we're not going to get into the reasons why that happened, at least not this morning. But this is a significant event, especially for the writings of the book of Romans. The church in Rome began with Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And a few Gentiles would come to faith and they would kind of sprinkle in. But all of a sudden, all the Jewish people were commanded and forced to leave. And so this church that was predominantly Jewish but had a little bit of a Gentile flair suddenly overnight became completely different. It was only Gentile people. Their, culture, their cultural ways kind of shifted. The way in which they worshipped kind of shifted. Everything about their context changed and, and very quickly. A few years later, the new emperor allowed the people back into Rome. And so many of these Jewish people came back and and wanted to reconnect with their local church, only to having found that their local church didn't look very much like it did when they left. Now that's not necessarily good nor bad, but change is easy, isn't it? No? (laughs) For some, change is easy. For most, change is difficult. They walked back into what looked like home, but didn't really feel like home. The ways in which they did things were changed. The ways in which they worshipped were changed. And Paul writes this letter, the letter to the Romans, as a way to say, look, your cultural divide does not need to be the thing that divides you. In fact, it is the lordship of Jesus that unites you together. So don't just do things the way that you want to do them, and don't just try and fight for your way to be reinstated, but work together with people to worship collectively. Here's, this is why this is important for our context, too. 
And I've asked this before, but we're going to ask it again. How many of you are from Banff? <laughs> yeah, put her hand up. <laughs> Not very many. How many are from Canada? Okay, more. How many are from a different part in the world? Right? This is, this is where we live. And this might surprise some of you. But people from Brazil or Chile or the UK or Australia, they worship differently than I do. They have different church traditions than I do. And all of them make me really uncomfortable because they're different. And the question is, are we going to rally together and go, it doesn't matter if you kind of, you know, like, well, let's say it this way. How many of you like to clap your hands during music? And how many of you don't because other people don't? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lee always bugs me about this. He wants it to be lively. And there's just so many conservative people here. The no, the tambourine's staying right where it is. <laughs> That's not coming out. But we have this exact kind of analogy in our in our own church is people from different places that do things differently that pray in different ways i remember the first time i prayed with a group of koreans anybody ever prayed with a group of koreans do you know what koreans do when they pray together they all pray together at the same time all out loud that was not my tradition that i grew up in we did it very orderly and very quietly, and what we thought was very respectfully. And I remember coming with them for this prayer meeting, and I was like, okay, great, this is great, let's pray about this thing. And, and we went around the circle, and people shared, and all of the sudden, it just got wildly loud, because everyone was passionately praying for these various things. Now, the only thing was they were all praying in Korean, and I was not understanding any of it. But we had talked about it, so I knew what they were saying. And it reminded me, okay, this is not wrong or bad, but it is different. And am I going to have some kind of a divide here going, no, 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 I don't like how you do that. I'm going to go pray with people that pray like me or that look like me or that act like me. It's very easy to divide. And Paul, in the letter to the Romans, says, don't do that. Unite together under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Put your little differences aside and maybe even learn from each other as we see people do things in a different way. This is what Corinth was all about. So, Aquila and Priscilla, working with Paul, and it says they worked with him uh, in the same trade, and they were tent makers, and, and this is just for your information, we're not really going to get into this because I don't think it's helpful, but there's all kinds of debate about what it means to be a tent maker. Was that very specific, like they actually uh, made tents out of either leather or cloth? That could be the case, the, the Greek word that's used here could be more general, as in one who works with leather or one who works with cloth-like material. Does it matter? No. They had the same occupation. They worked together. But then this strange verse in verse 5 comes up. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews and the, that the Christ was Jesus. And you're kind of like, when they showed up, Paul was occupied. What does this mean? And uh, really what Luke's trying to tell us here is that Silas and Timothy being in Macedonia for a while, collections were brought. And we see this in uh, Corinthians Specifically in 2 Corinthians 11, we see Paul talk and reference this. But as they were there in Macedonia, they took up a collection to help Paul so that he could focus more on the preaching of the word and not have to work as much in tent making to support himself. These other people gathered around with him to say, no, we want the gospel of Jesus declared and we recognize that we are going to help you in that purpose and in that process. And so the partnership with Aquila and Priscilla becomes even more because they take on some of his work as well so that he can dedicate himself to the preaching of the word. Does this not kind of remind you back to something that already happened in the book of Acts? Where all of a sudden the needs of the community were becoming too much, and, and the elders were struggling with how to move forward, and they went, well, we're going to figure out a different way. Let's appoint some other people to care for these individuals, these needs, so that collectively as a church, we don't neglect the preaching of the word and prayer. My experience is this. When church life gets busy, the first thing to stop is prayer. Not saying we don't pray, but we don't set aside time to corporately come together and to pray. I sent a challenge out on social media into your emails this last week, and 
I was really encouraged because this morning we had too many people in our prayer time and we couldn't fit in the library. And so we had to go to the fireside room. My, my hope is that over the coming months that we'll, we'll not be able to fit there and we'll have to come down here. Where once a month we set time aside where we gather together and we pray because the New Testament teaches us that prayer is the driving force of the church. Paul has been freed up to accomplish those things by these faithful men and women in Macedonia. But then we see something unique, at least for Paul, right? When you think about Paul's missionary journeys and and as the missionaries seek to kind of share the gospel with these various communities, opposition inevitably comes, always, every time. It's never not there. But here, all of a sudden, we see Paul get kind of a very human moment for Paul. Luke says, and when they opposed and reviled him, which we, the reader, by this point should be like, yeah, we expect that to happen. This is the normal pattern. This time, Paul says, he shakes out his garments and says to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. Done. You ever felt that way? Somebody that you're seeking to minister to? Somebody that you're seeking to love and to care for, and they continually reject that, or they continually abuse that, or they continually manipulate that in you? And you just go, man, I'm, I'm done. Now, I'm not saying that that's right or that's good. What I am saying is that Paul was human, just like you and I. And I think there's great encouragement in that because often when we think of some of these biblical characters, we think of people that were just superhuman and that were always, they would go no matter what. Here we see Paul's frustration. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we read about how Paul talks uh, of being afraid for his life in the city of Corinth in the first few days of his ministry, or in the first few weeks, months, we're not sure exactly how long, but initially there was great fear because of the opposition. Now, usually what we see is the opposition comes and there's a time where he gets stoned what they think to death and then he gets back up and goes back into the city to pray or to preach the gospel again. And all we kind of think of is, man, this guy's tenacious, he doesn't give up. But here we read about his fearfulness. I think that's encouraging, don't you? That as you seek to minister to people, that sometimes when we're afraid to stand up for something, when we're afraid to say something, when we're afraid of the consequences that are going to happen, that many faithful men and women who have planted many churches have been in that same situation as you and I. But here's the first point that we need to take away. Paul goes, man, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to the Gentiles, the Jewish people, they're my brothers, they're my sisters, they're my family, but they continually reject Christ. I'm done. Now again, this is a context. This is in Corinth. Paul's continued pattern of ministry will continue to be to go to the Jewish people and to the synagogues to preach the gospel. And especially in the book of Romans, we're going to see, when we read it, we see Paul's angst towards his own brothers and sisters to say these These are my family, and I care for them deeply. He's not just so angry, he quits. But what we see is just this idea of, I'm so overwhelmed, and they will not listen. I'm going to go speak to the Gentiles. But then what does verse 7 say, immediately following it? He left there, and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house happened to be next door to the synagogue. And verse 8 says, who comes to faith in Jesus? the ruler of the synagogue. The head Jewish person from a religious standpoint there in the synagogue goes, I confess that Jesus is the Messiah. Right after Paul said, I'm done. It's not working. What I'm preaching, they're not listening to. I'm going elsewhere. And God goes, Paul, Paul, Paul. Just be faithful to what I've called you and I will do the work in people's hearts. That should be so encouraging to us to know that even in the midst of whatever situation you're dealing with, God's still at work. The people that are rejecting Christ and and that you're trying to minister to, the people that continually are making choices that are leading to pain and heartache and all of these things, and, and you might want to do the same thing as Paul and wash your hands of it and say, I'm done with it. Or do we say, God, even though this is frustrating and hard, I know that you are still at work. 
We pray this all the time, right? God loves our loved ones way more than we do. Peter says that it's God's desire that all would come to faith. He is running after people to show them his goodness. A rejection against God shouldn't hurt us. It's a rejection against God. And we should faithfully pray for and try to minister as best as we can, but we need not rely that it is by the preaching of me or by my um, influence in their life that they're going to come to faith in Jesus because that's not how it works. They come to faith in Jesus because the Holy Spirit convicts them that they need Christ. Now, should we minister? Absolutely. But should we put, should we put them and, and what we're seeking to accomplish in God's hands? Yes. So let me say it this way, because I know that many of you are in this boat, as probably I think most of us are. There are people in your life that you love that you are going, man, there's no hope. I'm done. Don't be done. God's still at work. Christmas is the example. Notice what it says. He believed in the Lord. Who else believed? Not only him, but his entire household. Not only him, but many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believe and were baptized. The church is growing like crazy out of frustration and wanting to give up and fear for his life God says, don't worry, Paul, I'm at work. And the church grows exponentially. Now, just one quick, quick little side kind of thought here. A couple of months, or a couple weeks ago, well, I guess it might be a couple of months ago now, um, and over the course of summer, we baptized quite a few people, and and we do baptism, what we call believer's baptism, and, and we talked about it back then, but I just want to point out that this text is, is one of the reasons that we do this. Is we baptize people following a confession of faith in Jesus because that's what we see as the normative pattern in Scripture. Crispus and his whole household believes. Others hear, believe, and are baptized. Now, we're not, again, we're not going to divide over these things. I have a, a wonderful friend here in town who's a pastor of another church, and they practice baptism differently, and yet we work together, we minister together, we love each other, and we pray for each other. We differ on this, and that's okay, but what I'm just trying to point out here is that everything that we do as a church, we do because we're interpreting Scripture as best as we can from a holistic standpoint to say, what does the Bible teach us about this specific thing? Here we see this. We believe, and then we're baptized. Okay, back to verse 9. Luke interjects here with kind of an interesting thing. And I don't know if this is isolated. I don't know if this happened many times to Paul or if this is just a singular, unique event. And it doesn't really matter, but it's interesting to read. Again, with the context in uh, Corinthians that Paul is fearful for his life, from his ministry, that he's anxious about whether he's going to live or die and uncertain of how God's going to move forward. In verse 9, we see that Paul receives a vision from the Lord. And the Lord says, do not be afraid. Go on speaking. Don't be silent. I'm, I'm with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many who are in the city who are my people. And so Paul stayed a year and six months teaching. In the midst of Paul's hurt, in his uncertainty, in his fear, God shows up and says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to strengthen you, and I'm going to protect you. Now again, this is not the normative pattern for Paul moving forward, nor was it in the first part of his life, is there's a lot of opposition that he faces. And what God wasn't saying was, don't worry, Paul, from this day forward, you will never have opposition. We know that as we go through the rest of Acts, but we see that through Paul's life, he ultimately loses his life for his faith in Jesus. But there's a moment here, there's a season of his life where God says, Paul, I'm going to give you reprieve from that because I have purpose in the city of Corinth. I think safe to say Paul having this vision, 
You know, whether that means like it's a dream at night or whether it's through the day or whatever, but all of a sudden to be so convinced that God has told me, huh, I'm going to be good for a little while here. Man, I can't believe the relief that would overwhelm him. Maybe that spurred him on to preach the gospel even more boldly. We don't know. But what we do know, God promises, and then Luke points out, and God fulfills his promise real fast. So he's had this vision, and what's the first thing that happens? The Jews make a united attack on Paul. And Paul's like, okay, God, I thought we had this conversation. What's going to happen here? And so they go before uh, Galio, who's the proconsul, basically means he was the provincial uh, overseer. Um, and they go to him and they say, man, look, this, this Paul here, he's persuading people to worship God uh, contrary to our law. Now, this is a normal accusation, right? This has been accused of Paul several times through his missionary journeys. And he's had to either make defense, or, or we're going to see later on, he will continue to have to make defense against that. Sometimes he gets thrown in prison. Sometimes he gets beaten in front of everyone. Uh, there's various things that happen. And so Paul here, verse 14, what does it say? But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galio went, no, we're not having that conversation. It's not happening. This is about your rules, your laws. I'm not entering into this. No, do not bring this before me. He, can, he is not doing anything worthy of, of imprisonment or beating or punishment. Now, let me be real clear here. That doesn't mean Galio was on Paul's side, not by any stretch. He's simply trying to remain neutral. And we see this happen lots. In fact, we see this with Jesus right before he goes to the cross, don't we? Right? As we see the, the religious leaders, we see the provincial leaders, we see the government authorities basically trying to go, like, see to it yourselves. But the neat thing here for me is that for God to go, okay, Paul, don't worry, no one's going to harm you. And then the next thing that happens is they're all having a united attack against him. And he gets dragged, well, he doesn't get dragged. He gets brought before this, this influential person who can decide his fate. And he's about to speak and he doesn't even have to. It's just God's immediate faithfulness to what he has promised Paul. Again, I, this doesn't happen often. In fact, the book of Hebrews says that, that most of the people that, that we read about in Scripture, most of them welcomed God's promises from a distance. They looked forward and they could see that God was going to be faithful and fulfill what he promised, but he hadn't yet fulfilled that. And the same might be true in our lives in some ways. Is, is some way we, we might not know exactly how God's going to intervene. We might get a diagnosis that scares us and we might... Be sitting there going, I don't know what the outcome is for this. God hasn't told me that he's going to rescue me from this. Well, Paul has many of those moments too. And he's faithful in those moments. But here, there's just, there's just a moment for this. And I couldn't help but think back of uh, someone from the first church that I ministered at where Shayla grew up. He's a, a man named Wayne. And he was our head usher. And uh, Wayne was very unique. On his right hand, he didn't have a thumb. And so whenever he went to shake your hand for the first time, you were always like, it caught you off guard a little bit. And then he would make some hilarious joke about it. And then he was best friends with everybody. And Wayne would just constantly be the source of encouragement. And, and I remember him coming into the senior pastor's office, and I was with them, and with him and his wife, and they said he got a diagnosis of cancer. And so... We just sought to listen to him for a little while, and he went, don't worry. God's made very clear to me that this, he's got purpose in this. And we were like, okay, Wayne, let's pray with you, and let's walk through with you. And whatever it was, a few months later, kind of went through the process, and, and then a few months later, everything looked good, and all of a sudden, he was cancer-free. And we were like, okay, sometimes God answers prayers, and a way where he rescues people from the situation. A few years later, Wayne got cancer again, and this time God didn't rescue him. And he succumbed to the illness. And it's a reminder that sometimes God intervenes and rescues from situation and circumstance. Sometimes God does, and he gives us strength to persevere through it. Sometimes he gives us strength to persevere into it, which ultimately 
takes our life. And we're going to see that when we get to the end of the book of Acts with Paul. He preaches the gospel to his very last days. And in 2 Timothy, as we read about his very last breaths before he's about to be killed, we see a man no less committed to the gospel of Jesus, knowing that he's about to die. I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what's happening in your circumstance. Maybe God will rescue you and change the circumstances around it. Maybe he'll give you strength to endure the circumstances. Or maybe maybe these last days are these last days. I don't know. But what I do know is that God is capable and that God can do all things and that God is faithful to his promises. And the most important thing is that he has been faithful to bring the Lord Jesus to the cross, that he died willingly on the cross as substitution for us that we might have life and that we might have hope and that so that as Paul will say later is to live as Christ and to die is because we get to go be with the Lord Jesus. Is God faithful? Yeah. Do we live in a broken and fallen world? Yeah. But do we have to fear that? No, we have hope and hope eternal. Now, here's the thing that's really challenging in verse 17. We see Galio kind of intervene and go, no, I'm not, not getting involved. And for Paul, that's great news. He gets, he gets to go be free, but then look what it says in verse 17. And so they all seized Sosthenes, oh, sorry, Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the tribunal, but Galio paid no attention to him. Is There's debate whether Sosthenes is the same, of the same name in 1 Corinthians, or whether these were two different people. We we don't know. That was a fairly common name. It's uncertain, but but either way, whether he was uh, a sympathizer of Christian people, or whether he had already uh, decided to follow Jesus uh, and then was beaten for that, we don't know. Or whether it was the crowds going, fine, you're not going to intervene. We're just going to take a random person and beat them to death until you intervene. And so it's a reminder for us that, that even as, as Paul's being kind of rescued from his circumstance for a little bit, that doesn't mean that everyone is. There's still hurt and there's still pain and there's still difficulty. There's still persecution against the church and there's still opposition against the preaching. And I think from Paul's perspective, and again, reading through First and Second Corinthians, we kind of see this in a bigger picture. But from Paul's perspective, I'm sure he was very grateful for this reprieve, this little time where, where he was able to not be in danger of losing his life. But that didn't slow him down any to think, oh, life is good. He went, I have a mission, and I have a calling, and I have a purpose, and there are people everywhere that need to hear about the gospel of Jesus, no matter the cost. Here's the thing that we can learn from. Will we have that same belief? Will we have that same conviction? We live in a time and a a season right now of in this country, a very prolonged season of freedom from basically all persecution. There's some. But there's many in the world who, if they walk down to the street with a Bible, can be imprisoned or shot on the spot, no questions asked. You and I have the freedom to walk around with as many Bibles as we want with no repercussions, or very little anyway. Will that... Will that reality cause us to become a little bit lax in our faith? Will we lose focus of what our mission and our calling is because life is pretty good in some sense? And will we focus on our own desires, what we want to accomplish and do in our careers? Or will we continually put Jesus as the centerpiece of everything and go, I've been called to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that God has commanded. That mission, that purpose is no less for us than it was for Paul. God will be faithful. God is working even when we can't see it. But now we have a response to make. Will we step out in faith and seek to accomplish the task that God has called us to?
That's the question that I leave you with this morning. Let's pray. God, as we consider these verses, as we meditate on them, I pray that as we go from here this morning, that we wouldn't just forget it and move on, but that we would meditate on them, that we would consider them over the the days and months ahead, that we would look at what is the calling that you have placed on our lives. We have been called to make disciples. Are we doing that? Are we seeking to minister to people and to help them in their spiritual growth? Or are we so focused on our own lives and our own circumstances that we have no time for other people? The world is constantly battling for our times and our affections and our desires. Would we recognize that? Would we see that and and, and would we not get melancholy with that? But may we see that you have called us with purpose and you have blessed us in a, in a certain sense in this time, in this place, where we have the religious freedom to declare Christ and to make him known. So may we step out of these walls and may we go seek to do that with our friends and our families, our co-workers, our housemates, with people that we encounter, that we would look for moments where we can share the good news of Jesus Christ because that is the reason that we are here. So help us seek to accomplish the Great Commission the way that you have called us to. Thank you that you are working even when we don't see it. And the story of Crispus being a great example of that, where Paul's frustrated and yet you're still working. Would you remind us of that in our own lives with the loved ones that we are caring for, that we are not seeing results from that we would hope? May we continue to pray for and to lift them up. And may we look back and remember how often you are faithful. May we look back to the cross and may we remember that we have been given hope for all of eternity and that there's nothing that the world can do to take that from us. And may we seek to accomplish the purposes to which you have called, that we would go and make disciples. Thank you for all of these truths. Help us to meditate and dwell on these things in the days ahead. As we have a time of coffee and fellowship together now, God, would you draw us together as one body? Would we care for each other? Would we encourage each other? And would we help each other? Thank you for this family. Thank you for their love and their care. Go with us today now. Amen.